Sorry. All right, and we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, for wherever you are in the world, it's evening where I am, and hello from a cold, um, threatening to snow, in fact, Stellenbosch in the Western Cape. Joining me tonight are my fellow partners, Tim Willis, CEO of Simple Capital, and Blake Musgrove, CIO, joining from, uh, never quite sure, but I believe, Tim, you're in Bryanston, and I believe, Blake, you're at home in Saltrock. Am I right? That's right, Philip. Yeah, that's right. Wonderful. All right, ladies and gents in the audience, tonight's a momentous occasion. We are, in fact, broadcasting from our very own platform that we've built to enable removal of friction for investors such that when they are in these webinars with us, there's a direct integration with underlying company information and also the ability to invest. We do syndicate with LinkedIn and with YouTube, and so welcome to the viewers from LinkedIn and YouTube channels as well. Um, as per usual, we do like to do this digitally in a two-way fashion. And so on screen, you will see two QR codes. On the left-hand side, to join our notification service, the QR code on the left, should you scan it, will open up a WhatsApp group that you'll then automatically join. And in that group, what we do is to send you simple capital-related news and notifications. It's not a spam channel. It's not an overly active channel. It's not a two-way chat channel. This is our ability to notify you of important things that's happening in the world of simple capital and for you as an investor. On the right-hand side is a call to action QR code. So if you scan that, it'll take you through to a form that you can complete specifically pertaining to tonight's investment opportunities should you like what you see and to give you straight and frictionless access into making your investment into those underlying companies. As per usual, we do have to talk about a little bit of regulation and housekeeping before we kick off. And so, Tim Willis, CEO of Simple Capital, can I ask you just to talk us through investor requirements and able, uh, to enable people to participate tonight? 
Thanks, Willem. Uh, yeah, and that's right. Like if, you, if you're investing with us, you have to meet one of these uh, requirements, which is a self-certification. You do it at the time of signing your investment agreements. And it's either self-certifying as a sophisticated investor or self-certifying as a high net worth individual investor. If you're a sophisticated investor, you need to meet one of four criteria and, and, and they're all ORs. So it's just one of these four criteria. You're either a member of a network or syndicate of business angels, and you have been that for at least the last six months prior to the date of investment. You've made an investment in one or one investment in an unlisted company in the past two years. Uh, you're working or your professional capacity is in the private equity sector where you provide finance to small businesses. Or you are currently a director of a company that has an annual turnover of at least a million pounds. So that is to be a sophisticated investor or a high net worth investor. Uh, in the year preceding your investment, you had an annual income of £100,000 or more, or you have net assets to the value of £250,000 or more, and that excludes certain assets such as your primary residence. So those are the requirements that you need to meet. Well, you need to meet one of those requirements and then you're good to invest. Okay, brilliant. And thanks very much. Uh, important perhaps just to underscore, as you have already said, that those are all requirements, not and requirements. And so ladies and gents, getting you one of those puts you in the ability to then be able to participate in tonight's investments. Again, perhaps just as our viewer numbers are climbing, people always seem to have a couple of minutes to exit the previous meeting and enter a new uh, conversation like tonight. Uh, for those of you that had missed it, on the left-hand side on screen, a QR code that lets you into our notification service at Simple Capital, where we can let you know about exciting deals that have come live before we've organized a webinar, uh, as an example, um, other news-related items, and on the right hand side, should you like what you see tonight, your ability to scan and invest immediately. All right, then on to tonight's uh, participants. I am joined by Tim and Blake, familiar faces to the Simple Capital fraternity. If you are new to the fraternity, welcome. Tim is our CEO and Blake is our CIO. Um, we've got outside party guests tonight as well in the form of Tim, Brian, Alistair and Bert. Bert, perhaps a known name and almost like a household brand inside of the Simple Capital Stable being one of our very first investments um, who you can get to engage with a little bit again tonight. At this stage, though, let's switch gears. And I wanted to preface tonight's conversation with an overview of macro trends. Uh, there's a lot happening in the world right now, post sort of getting over the idea of COVID and the pandemic. Um, I mean, markets seem to be headed in, in directions that uh, scare some of our investors. And so here tonight to talk us through some of the macro trends uh, is Blake Musgrove. Blake, uh, first of all, welcome. Welcome back. It's been a while since we've been online. And uh, let's get the house view of the macro picture. Over to you. Thanks, Willem. Never a dull moment in uh, global macro markets. So um, as many of you know, at Simple Capital, we run a top-down monthly meeting. So the last few meetings really have been interesting given all the moving parts from, from a macroeconomic perspective. Um, firstly, Europe's at war. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I mean, that's rattled commodity markets, exacerbated supply side shocks. And yeah, there's been material impact on exports of oil, natural gas, agricultural commodities, metals, and all that's done is it's pushed up energy prices food prices and commodity prices. So these higher commodity prices have led to massive inflationary pressures in the global economy. So just to give some stats, global inflation is pro projected to be around 7% in 2022, which is twice the average of the last decade. Um, we're seeing record levels of inflation in the US. So 8.5% in April, the highest in 40 years. 9.1% print in the UK in May, and the Eurozone expected to be about 8.5%. So, I mean, these are really unprecedented levels. And high inflation has led to a structural increase in interest rates globally. Um, so, it's the end of, you know, easy monetary policy. 
and it's the the end of quantitative easing. So, I mean, this has been illustrated through further rate hikes from the Fed in the last uh, meeting. It was 75 basis points. And we're seeing this across, you know, multiple central banks across the globe. And so higher interest rates and higher inflation leads to broad-based growth forecasts being revised downwards. So in a lot of the core geographies, it's still marginally positive, but it has been revised downwards. So the US 2.6% this year, GDP growth, but the probability of a recession is increasing. Uh, China, 4.5% revised downwards due to the COVID lockdowns. Europe, 2.7% for 2022 GDP growth, also revised downwards. Then obviously topical, we've got Russia contracting about 10% and Ukraine uh, contracting anywhere from up to 50% uh, this year. And this has all had also had a knock on to a lot of emerging markets, uh, GDP growth outlooks uh, for this year. And so, you know, the house view is that we at Simple Capital are looking for uh, businesses that could benefit or thrive despite choppy waters. So if you just look at food inflation, um, food insecurity, many people uh, across the African continents are below the poverty line. Um, and so this is going to put increased pressure on them. So, um, you know, this could result in more remittances from African diaspora living overseas, sending money back to their family on the continent. And so that's a clear tailwind for business like Tulix, which we're featuring tonight which is looking to lower the cost of transacting and transferring money um, from international markets back to Africa. I mean, we've got so much going on in the global front and uh, at home in South Africa, you know, it's we, we're fighting our own structural battles uh, with a failing utility in ESCOM, uh, increased load shedding, which everyone's feeling the pain. And so that's a clear tailwind for home energy that's riding the wave of, of solar installations across the country. So this is the, the kind of businesses that we look like that can thrive in choppy waters. Um, I mean, it's no, it's no secrets. Venture capital uh, industry um, has seen a sell-off in valuations. Um, aggressive sell-off was at first seen in the listed tech space. Uh, and this is filtered into private markets, typically six to nine months afterwards. You've got higher discount rates and because of, you know, the for higher forecasted future earnings um, an increase in that discount rate causes a sell off in tech stocks from a public perspective. Um, the earlier stage businesses have been quite resilient, but later stage businesses within VC have encountered some headwinds. So valuations have come down and funding has slowed sequentially, you know, quarter on quarter. To put some stats around that, the highest peak of, um, of funding was November 2021, last year, 70 billion. That's come down to just below 40 billion in May of this year. Um, so we can be sure that there will be some volatility that persists, uh, but where there's volatility, there's great opportunities to be uncovered and great businesses at great prices. There's a record amount of capital sitting in the asset class, and there was a record amount of first-time managers that were actually raising funds. So there's a lot of dry powder. So we will see competition in the good deals. And it's our view that if you take a longer-term view, you look at sub-sectors that are less, less cyclical in nature, um, and you look at the instruments, you can hedge your downside risk on valuation, and it's a great time to enter. So there is one... Uh, chart that I'd like to pull up. Um, this just illustrates, I suppose, the gravity of the revision in some of the valuations across subsectors, uh, notably high growth payments fintech. So this is global data from PitchBook as at the end of June. You can see that in uh, the high growth payments fintech sector globally, valuations on a next 12 month basis. So a forward, forward looking revenue, revenue multiple touched 30 times. Now it's around 10 times. Neo banks and crypto, obviously we know there's been a crypto winter, 15 times to less than five times. And so if you take a longer term view, it really is our view that it's a good time to deploy. 
And at Simple Capital, our portfolio has been hedged by the fact that we've largely invested in convertible notes and safe notes, which have a valuation cap or discount. But upon crystallization or sorry, conversion of those instruments into priced equity rounds, in this environment, if those priced equity rounds are conducted at a lower valuation, we will convert at that lower valuation. The cap is the highest valuation that would ever be paid, but you've got, um, so you hedged on the upside, but you you can participate if uh, valuations are conducted lower. So that's my little macro summary and VC activity uh, summary. So Willem, back over to you. Just before I let you go, Blake, thanks very much for that. Perhaps two comments. Um, on the first, with quantitative easing disappearing, it, it, kind of the easy money seems to have evaporated. And so perhaps a little bit more importance around looking at who these entrepreneurs are that we are backing, given that the emphasis is now on the ability of that founder to pull it through without easy money around. So we're looking for a little bit more grit and resilience in the type of people that we choose to back. Um, and then just for load shedding for our international viewers, it's only really the people from Queensland and South Africa that will know what the term means. That essentially it's rolling blackouts, um, which I saw actually kicked off in Australia, uh, Queensland about two weeks ago. Um, and so with energy crisis in mind, we'll be exploring a little bit more around that technical term with Tim uh, from home a little bit later on. But before we do that, Tim Willis, our own Tim, uh, we are pretty much known for bundles, um, but tonight's about community rounds. I would really appreciate if you could just illuminate the difference for us and just talk us through the terminology of community round. Thanks, Milan. Uh, so I guess like any any business, we are evolving somewhat, uh, and and um, we've we've found a very successful uh, spot in the market, which we which we believe is these community rounds. Maybe if I touch on bundles before, bundles are generally three to four companies um, and private individuals like the folks on this webinar were able to uh, invest. And one of the reasons why we really like bundles is that we would put, uh, you know, 400 companies through a very intense program and identify the three or four that we really thought were the best fit for that quarter and uh, take those out to our community. And you can see there, since since inception at Simple Capital, we've raised four bundles um, valued at over one and a half million dollars um, in aggregate. However, as we were going through this bundle process, uh, some of the founders really liked our infrastructure and were getting very excited about what we were doing. Uh, and so started talking to us about, hey, can we do something similar to a bundle, but just for their company? Um, and initially, we reserved this for follow-on rounds uh, where we had an, a company in a bundle and then wanted to allow our community to just invest in that company. Uh, but we're partnering with founders more and more to allow them to uh, both bring their community as well as our community to uh, supercharge what we are now calling community rounds. Um, and as you can see, uh, community rounds, we've actually raised uh, just under $2 million uh, through, this, uh, through this product since inception. So it's a, it's a very successful um, initiative uh, that a lot of people are enjoying participating in. And I think this is just another example. Uh, so I think we've got our most recent bundle there, the Q1 2022 bundle. Um, and then an example is Tulix, which is one of the companies that we'll be showcasing tonight. And uh, I think for our community, uh, you know, we will continue to do bundles. We we really do believe that they're a great they're a great product, and uh, we love the diversification that they bring for our for our community. Uh, and we have a couple up our sleeve, but tonight is all about the community round and about backing some amazing founders. Okay, brilliant. So let's delve into what the community rounds tonight entail. Uh, we've got three enterprises that are doing community rounds with us tonight. And um, I made dead sure of the pronunciation of this one before the webinar started. There's no silent H here, it's home energy. Tim, tell us about that. Yeah, so super exciting um, businesses tonight. 
uh, home energy being the first one, operations in both South Africa and the US, uh, and it's incorporated in the US, which is a trend that you will see uh, throughout. Uh, and I think I'm just going to give a, a, a starter package for, for home, which is that they've just signed an enormous 500 million rand deal with Nedbank. So this is a really exciting uh, opportunity for, for our investors and our community to get involved in. All right, brilliant. Then we've got two more. Yep. So Tulix, Blake mentioned it earlier, it's smart remittances in Africa. This is a significant problem. It's a $95 billion market and it impacts over 200 million families across the continent. They've started in Kenya, also incorporated in, in Delaware in the US. Okay, so big addressable market there. If, if this can be hooked through, sounds very, very exciting. We'll hear from the founder a little bit later. And then a uh, familiar name to all of us uh, in the Silver yeah. Capital table. So uh, we're very fortunate to have Bert, who's uh, quickly becoming a superstar in the world of uh, startups in, in the US and Canada. Uh, he's on with us tonight. Uh, and I think uh, Bill has done exceptionally well since we first invested in September 2020. Started with operations just in Canada. They've grown that to, to Chicago in the US and they're starting to roll into a couple of other towns. And I think the key metric here is 412% year on year revenue growth. Uh, that's an incredible number. And they continue to uh, add on the revenue month after month. So really exciting business. And we are yeah, excited to, to bring this again to our community. Tim, there's a joke about the cobbler's kid's shoes. And I just want to point out the irony here. Uh, Builder is one of our first uh, investments of Simple Capital. Uh, I've just gone through the process of renovating a house and all the pain associated with it, even though there's a company that could have actually, uh, well, very close to me, that could have helped me through the process. So the cobbler's shoes comments holds true even in venture capital. Um, okay, let's look at community rounds just in a little bit more detail. We've got two more slides on those before we get to Tim Olson. Yeah, so I think this is this is just a summary of what we've been talking about, giving access, uh, access to investors to the best deals around the world, sometimes via a bundle, sometimes via a community round. And a community round is really an assimilation of uh, some of some um, you know, smaller checks, some bigger checks, uh, and really just support for the founders. So we, we're really excited to show uh, these three businesses to our community tonight. Tim, I do have a question that's just popped through online. Um, and thank you very much for submitting the question. And I, I, I would hold off ordinarily until the end, but this talks to uh, the concept of community round. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to go off script real quick and say the question is, Will the investment model be the same for community rounds, i.e. SPV with our investment split equally amongst them? Let's just quickly get clarity on this before we go into the exciting part of all of the underlying startups tonight. Uh, correct. So a community round has all the same benefits as if you were investing in a bundle. You're going to invest in a preference share that is, uh, that is in a special purpose investment vehicle. Um, that holds the underlying asset. Uh, so you, you have the benefits of that preference share being, uh, you know, liquidity as well as, uh, you know, the ability to move it around if you need to. Uh, and you deal with us as simple capital. So your relationship continues to deal with us and we will provide all the reporting. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of our investors have seen, um, you know, we're really trying to up our game on that side. Uh, some of the investors will have seen our new portal. Um, and, and, and so all of those benefits will still be in place, whether you invest through a bundle or through a community round. And now, Tim, just for the sake of absolute clarity here, uh, in other words, what we're talking about tonight is three separate uh, investments. It's not a blended investment. And so for investors tonight, you don't put cash in and it is split between the three investments that we're talking about tonight. You have to choose individually which one or which ones you want to back. Am I right? Yes. Correct. 100% correct. And you'll see if you get to the point where you are interested in investing, the form will ask you which companies you want to invest in. And, and you'll have to put a separate amount next to each one's name if you, if you get excited and uh, like what you see here. 
Right, and if you do get excited and like what you see, there is that QR code that you can scan that talks about Invest Now, takes you to the form. But there's also, in terms of our very new platform that we're extremely proud of, uh, a pink button. Um, pink is one of the accentuation colors that we use at Simple Capital. So we've hopefully accentuated that well enough to stand out to help you with your call to action. Tim, um, this is not our first community round. Let's just talk a little bit about how community rounds have got in the past. Yeah, so we have some great examples where community rounds have really supported businesses. Um, and you can see here, uh, companies like Plentify, Flex Club, Moment, Sweep South um, have all had really successful uh, community rounds before, which uh, both our community have partaken in as well as their community. And in the case of a business like Pocket, actually doing a community round enabled them to get to the investment number that they were wanting. So they went out uh, looking for about $250,000 of investment. Some of that came direct, some of it came as, a, as an outcome of, of having participated in our community round program. So, uh, and the same with Yebo Fresh. So it's a really exciting uh, proposition for founders. And I think it's bringing even more uh, diversification and uh, exciting deals to our platform which is really what we're trying to do with our community is is make sure that there's always something exciting to to look at and get involved in um before this webinar went live we already have some interest so some folks have already reached out and said hey we want to get involved in these deals so before we've even taken this to our community we've already got uh some checks that have been written for for these three companies so we're hoping to get Get those up to their max allocation, which I think is about two hundred thousand dollars each across the board. Um, but yeah, that's where we stand, and, and we're we're excited about what we're presenting this evening. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much, Tim and Blake. Um, ladies and gents, what we're going to do now is to bring the founders of these three opportunities up on screen. We've pre-agreed a format with them. Um, we'll do a quick introduction, get to know who they are, and then allow them to showcase their business to you at the end. There is a ability for you to post questions like the question we've already received tonight. But in the comments section, please make sure to use that if you have questions or comments. They get forwarded to me on a screen here, which we'll bring into the conversation for the founder to answer directly um, or perhaps to share in the event of it being a comment. And so without further ado, let's bring Tim Olsen uh, into the conversation tonight. And um, we're patching him through. There we go. Tim? I'm Hello and welcome. Uh, first of all, where are you? I'm currently in Durban at the moment. All right. Well, welcome from the East Coast. Um, we're going to give you some time to do your presentation. Firstly, welcome to the Simple Capital Fraternity and all of the best for your presentation tonight. Awesome. Over to Thanks, Willem. I actually wanted to kick off with a topic that you range uh, put forward, Willem, around load shedding. And you know, for us, it's it's become something that's so synonymous with just day to day lifestyle in South Africa. But when you actually look at it globally, it's it's you know also happens in other more developed countries. So you mentioned Australia; uh, they've recently had some challenges. But in Texas last year, there were massive brownouts that were happening, where literally the power network froze over. There are even some developments happening in Germany. So even though we call it load shedding, you know, those places they call brownouts or blackouts, and they are not just um, unique to South Africa. And what is quite interesting about that is it actually is starting to show the revolution that is starting to happen where you're literally moving from centralized power plants and um, monopolistic utilities like ESCOM, and we're moving towards decentralized power plants without any crypto, but decentralized power plants where homeowners and businesses are actually becoming what we call prosumers, which is consumers that are pro actually producing and storing their own electricity and feeding it back into the network and they start balancing what is actually happening. So. As a business, um, obviously a very exciting space um, for us to be in, very topical in terms of tonight and what's been happening with stage six. And unfortunately, the outlook for South Africa obviously doesn't look too great when it comes to ESCOM and the load shedding outlook over the next couple of years. Um, but I'd like to think that what we're building at home is a very reliable and a very unique solution that is, will hopefully alleviate a lot of the pain for South Africans. Um, to kick off, um, with that intro said, I, my name is Tim Olsen. I'm the founder and CEO of Home. I've been in the energy space for 14 years now, built multiple businesses. And what I'm very excited about when I reflect on my journey in the energy space in South Africa is having gone from build, building engineering-based businesses, some software businesses, 
uh, also being involved in some larger project infrastructure funding opportunities. What the energy sector is actually missing, specifically in South Africa, is a, a service provider that can really operate at scale. So really looking at distribution at scale, the technology uh, technologies exist. It's just how do you get access to them? How does the general consumer get access to them? Um, and then also really providing a, a solution that consumers can trust, especially when you look at it from a homeowner's perspective. You know, there are so many options out there. So you don't know, uh, you know which installer is, is reliable, who's going to provide you quality work when it comes to installing your, uh, your solar system. Um, so there's a really big piece that's missing around trust and a trusted consumer brand. And that's really the, some of the things that we've seen in the space of the last couple of years and what we're trying to build within home to really build that trusted brand that consumers can relate to, helping them really solve a lot of the, the pain points when it comes to energy, while obviously also positioning them when it comes to the kind of the future of what the energy sector looks like when you start looking at uh, energy efficiency for uh, lighting, heat pumps, and ultimately things like electric vehicles. So very, very exciting space and industry that we're in. And I think um, ha even though I've spent 14 years in the space, I think it's just getting started and I can't wait for, for what lies ahead. Um, in terms of my discussion tonight, I wanted to kind of take a slightly different tact. Um, I, I just quickly want to highlight maybe some of the, the challenges and some of the problems that you guys are facing, because I'm sure a lot of the viewers tonight are have been or are looking for solar solutions at the moment. And the kind of status quo option is to probably resort to Google um, search and find, you know, the nearest solar installer. You would typically go through some form of um, online form, you might drop an email, you might do a phone call, but that's really, you know, the first sign of how cumbersome the journey is because you don't really know where to go to kind of get those initial answers. And when you start going down the rabbit hole of what solar is all about, you start figuring, you start realizing that one, you don't know which solar installer to trust. Two, what are the right product solutions for you to choose from? Three, what are my finance options? And then four, who can I actually speak to just to understand what this is? Because the reality when it comes to solar um, rooftop installations, they are not an off-the-shelf product. You cannot walk into a mass mart and just pick something off the shelf. You have to really look at it from an engineering design point of view. It is a construction product at its core. So there are quite a few things that you're going to have to manage just to try and you know cover all the risks and the basis to for you to make that journey as, as smooth as possible. And that's really where, where home comes in. Um, so we have built a marketplace. So what we do, just like many other um, tech startups, we basically connect homeowners looking to go solar with vetted solar installers that we've vetted across the country. And we really manage the process end to end. Some subtle nuances, we don't just put a homeowner and a solar installer in touch and we walk away. We kind of run what we call managed curated marketplace. So we walk every single step of the journey with the homeowner and the installer, really making sure that you know you get the right solution that meets your needs, that you get proper sound advice that is unbiased around the various technology options, uh, that we really look at optimizing your solution. And that also starts tying into the financing piece, which is obviously a big theme in general, because these systems are expensive. You're spending on average, our systems that we're selling is about 170,000 Rand on our platform. So at the end of the day, you're buying a car, you need to have a, a viable finance solution to really make it possible for you to purchase these systems. And you know, there's again, a lot of nuances just exploring that, that avenue. And we really walk with you um, throughout that entire journey, make sure that you are covered every single step of the way. Um, by a way of background, the, the way that this platform and our business came about was we actually were a solar installer many years ago. So we're physically selling and installing solar in people's homes. And we realized there are a lot of points of friction for solar installers. So we decided to actually automate uh, the process by building our own internal tool. It was never designed to be used by other solar installers, let alone become a marketplace. But it came from a place of us really trying to solve our own pain points and trying to automate and make our business a lot more efficient. Um, and that's when we realized, you know, that once we fire this thing up, that, you know, it's very powerful and it could really benefit not just us, other solar installers and ultimately the industry. But what was super interesting about our journey and the, uh, the path that kind of led us to where we are today is there are a lot of pain points for homeowners. And I think I mentioned, covered some of them. Some of you may have already been experiencing it yourself, kind of trying to investigate uh, viable routes of going solar. There are a lot of challenges for solar installers themselves. 
very manual businesses, very archaic, often a limited automation. You're constantly switching between different systems, different tools, whether it's like solar design tools, then manually picking up a phone, speaking to a product supply source product. Then you've got different sales and CRM tools. So just everything is kind of like not really streamlined in a way that you could build your business more efficiently. Um, but then you also need to look at it from a financier's perspective. And what is super interesting is that the solar the residential solar finance industry in South Africa is actually very, very early stage. And it's it's very ironic because, you know, we have got this massive program that was built um, with ESCOM and our Department of Energy that allowed us to build massive power plants out in Uppington. And, you know, you have these fields of solar panels everywhere and all the banks love financing those. We've also seen the last five um, or eight years or so that there are a lot of uh, business solar installations that have been financed by the various banks. But when you start looking at the residential space, really limited things have been happening. And it's because the banks are struggling to manage the risk of vetting a solar installer and then overseeing that solar installer, making sure that they provide a quality system. So as a result, most solar systems that are financed through the banks at the moment are typically done through a available equity line of credit within your mortgage. And, you know, that does work, but not everyone has a um, either wants to or has available equity in their existing bond for them to kind of use to fund a 170, 200,000 rand solar system. So what we're very excited about and kind of what got our business to where we are today is we've really built this with a bank in mind. And what we often say to our banking partners is you got to see home as the platform for you to launch your solar finance product and then operate it as a product across the, the entire jurisdiction that you want to operate in. And um, even though we initially started with Investec and we ran a pilot with them last year, we are very proud to announce that we've signed a massive contract with Nedbank, specifically the MFC division, to bring a new finance product to market. And what makes this solar product so revolutionary is that it's the first product of its kind op operated and offered by a bank that isn't linked to your available equity. So it's a standalone finance facility that if you just need to own the property, you don't even need to bank with NetBank and you can potentially apply for this as a finance loan. So this product is, is being launched by us in NetBank uh, next month. Uh, very excited about it. It can really unlock a lot of potential. And one of the things that we really believe as a business is that solar as a technology is, is tried and tested, but it needs to be made more affordable. And this is one of the things that will really make solar more accessible and more affordable to the general consumer because the interest rates that they're looking at offering this this facility and this product um, at are incredibly competitive um, and when you start comparing those against the the current status quo rental finance office because there have been quite a few that are now on the market it really makes solar very compelling from a financial point of view where literally close to or give or take uh, you are able to actually finance your solar system from your savings the, the shortfall of the monthly installment that you would be paying is effectively the way that you got to think about uh, energy security. It's basically going to give you coverage for you to get the, the additional um, backup storage that you need during load shedding. And often, you know, you're talking about 500 to 1,000 bucks per month surplus that you need to fund out of your pocket, which is probably in line with what you're paying for your fiber um, facility at the moment anyway. So very, very exciting. Uh, from a um, from a kind of market and a helicopter point of view. And I think a perfect storm now with obviously what's happening with load shedding. Um, coming to the kind of slightly different tact I want to take tonight is I, I want to focus a bit on what's happening on the back end. Because as a marketplace, we're not the solar installer. We're not the financier. We are the, the network, the platform that coordinates and manages all the key stakeholders to really make the solar system and the solar um, solution experience happen um, for the consumer and all of our different stakeholders on the platform. And as a business, even though we have just come out of our um, closed beta um, the last couple of months, we've had a phenomenal surge in user activity. We are approaching over a thousand signups per month. We're currently conducting over 150 site visits across the country. We, as of this month, operating nationally. So we are operating in nine provinces. We've also launched in Ohio, which is our first state in uh, the US. And we're looking at launching in LA in the next couple of months too. So lots of things happening and the kind of the marketplace is starting to grow in different places. But from, from a business point of view, what we are currently really, really focused on is we know the technology works. We know we can onboard solar installers and we can we know we can bring on the financiers, but there are just a lot of things that we need to now manage as we scale through this next stage of our of our business, which is 
in many stay in many ways we often describe it as a rocket that's about to launch and you know everyone is climbing on and we got to hold on tight so there are a couple of things i just wanted to touch on so access to finance is a massive um a gap in the space and you know very lucky and very fortunate that we now have nedbank on our side who's really doing this in a very big way big reputable brand uh, we're going to be driving quite a lot of narrative around trust um in the space to really uh, create that consumer affiliation um that 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 the consumer is also looking for when it comes to you know someone that they can really rely on when it comes to exploring the solar journey uh, we are working very close with product suppliers because even though you think you know this is a bit of a gold rush which it is that there's just a lot of pent-up demand in the space getting quality product at the right time is a massive challenge so really working closely with product suppliers has been key we've had a phenomenal relationship with one of the largest product suppliers of the last year that's really helped us build our platform and our business and we really work very closely with them and look forward to obviously growing our network of product suppliers to make sure that we can lock in the adequate stock and service clients as they want their solar systems installed um, but that's also a big kind of like a uh, call it balancing act that we are doing in the in the background uh, another big factor is that we also need to really focus on the tech to automate this a uh, solar installer you know if if they kind of service 50 inquiries per month that's quite a lot if you're serving 100 you're getting quite big and quite professional your process is a lot tighter but you know taking over a thousand inquiries plus is obviously going to require a lot of automation and that's really what we've been focusing on and i'm very proud to say the kind of process the current systems that we have in place the current team that we have in place has really helped us get to this current stage but now we're really doubling down on tech so we deploying some new machine learning uh, features that will really help us automate we kind of compressing and kind of digitizing a whole bunch of experiences and some of the later parts of our process when it comes to installations to really get some more efficiency and automation there and also really looking at working very closely with our solar installers because without them this doesn't work so really looking at understanding their pain points and helping them get to a stage where you know they can grow their business um, as our network and our platform also grows so a lot of things happening on the back end uh, but i thought i'd just share you uh, share with you some of the things that are happening underneath the bonnet there's always lots of sexy and exciting stuff on the front end but a lot of things that are happening in the back of the kitchen to also really make the magic happen and yeah very fortunate in terms of where we are right now and super exciting for what lies ahead for our business amazing and i think uh, tim from a, the perspective of being in sort of the throes of the change over from old cold fired and legacy yep. energy grids to this new world um certainly poses a wonderful opportunity we've got some questions for you around this opportunity the first the most pertinent one what's your revenue model um so, are you taking bips on the finance or how does it work so i think our, our revenue model can evolve over time uh, but what it is at the moment is traditional marketplace so we take a transaction fee for every successful project that we originate on our platform right now we uh, take a 15 percent um, commission and that's split between solar installer and product suppliers we currently don't participate in the upside of the finance origination we are however due to this kind of new um, NetBank finance product, looking at also introducing um, insurance. And there's a big opportunity for us to also participate in some of the insurance origination. And we're working with some great insurance partners that we're looking at also bringing close into the marketplace. Yeah, huge opportunity as a lot of solar installers are now also needing to put physical limitations on the removal uh, prospects of solar panels just by virtue of the market not being saturated yet. So it's a key opportunity. Perhaps just a second question. Um, if you'll take one, Tim, is uh, what's the strategy on marketing? How do you build velocity? So having built businesses in the energy space, as I said before, people tend to kind of sell door to door or like direct. So let's like it's a person to person. Um, and what we saw as a big opportunity for this business, given that it's a platform, is really building a, a distribution, a, a scalable distribution play. And what we've been doing and how our platforms also been built really has been working with the banks. So what the, the banks typically do is once they understand what we are, which is we're not a solar installer that wants access mm -hmm. to their mortgage book. We are a platform that enables them to create more loans. And we are just the facilitator and the aggregator coordinating all the stakeholders and ensuring that everything is managed, great client experience, quality on site, et cetera. Um, what we actually do is we lean on our finance partners. 
So our finance partners are actually the ones who do all the outreach. So they email their clients, they look at their mortgage book, they look at their client book, they do emails, SMSs, MMSs, WhatsApp, private banker calls, whatever it takes to really get the origination going. And all the leads come through to our platform, sign up and go through the process of actually doing the initial proposal, automating um, their initial solo offer, and then kind of become a qualified user and go further down the funnel. But we're very fortunate at this stage because we actually don't do any of our own marketing. Everything is done by our distribution and finance partners. Okay. Um, Tim, I've got one more question here, and I think you are sort of touching on it by virtue of illustrating that you are a marketplace, not an actual solo installer yourself, which is important for investors to understand. Yeah. But as with all these new markets, like we saw with crypto, initially it's a free for all and yeah. then regulation starts to catch up and it starts to impose itself onto the free market. What's your team's feelings around pending or upcoming or pipeline regulation that will impact the, the distributability within this market space? Mm. So very recently, ESCOM made a announcement that they were thinking about not penalizing, but charging consumers um, for um, installing um, solar systems. And that's just because of how they need to balance out the network. And there's a lot of uh, unpredictability when it comes to adding a solar asset into a network. And suddenly you have this new surge of kilowatt hours that are being generated that ESCOM now needs to balance as part of their bigger network. And obviously, if hundreds of thousands of customers in store, it starts becoming a very big problem. Germany has actually been a prime example of that. So ESCOM is trying to think of how to um, kind of be remunerated for that additional burden and administration. The right way of where regulation should be going is really looking at time of use tariffing, which kind of incentivizes the consumer and the utility to start shifting load. And really we should be incentivized to feed that power back into the network. And when you start thinking about you know, the battery systems, because that's really the solution, you can't just install a solar panel on your roof and assume it solves load shedding. You actually need to couple solar panels with batteries. And as soon as you do that combination, you actually have this ability to store power. And you can feed that power in at different times of day, you know, when the network or your local municipality, ESCOM actually needs the most. So I think that's kind of the pro-regulation argument that, that we're very bullish about and that we're starting to see. And we're very pleased with the current position that ESCOM has taken, that NERSA has taken. Obviously, everything is still up in there. We don't know where it will go in the future. But for now, and also indefinitely, as long as consumers kind of store the electricity within the battery systems, they don't feed it into the network, you know, we should actually continue to be fine. The last thing I just wanted to maybe bring up, because it's been very interesting operating as a South African business in the US, kind of going between um, California and LA is our first um, California market, which is the most regulated state in the US when it comes to solar, to Ohio, which is our current live uh, and first uh, market in the US which is the most deregulated state. It's been super interesting kind of also getting insight in terms of how the U.S. is thinking about it. And I think South Africa is definitely at this stage on the more relaxed side of regulation, um, which again could be a, an opportunity and a challenge going forward. But at this stage, everything we've heard is very positive and we don't see it changing too drastically in the future. Okay, I've got the last question for you um, uh, for now, which is what are the financial forecasts for the coming year and which markets or regions will be the key drivers for those metrics or forecasts? Very good question. So we are ruthlessly focused on making this in a net bank campaign a success. It is this home run that we've been building our business for that we were at the right place at the right time and obviously 500 million rand is nothing to be sneezed at. And we know we can really get the market humming and get our business growing very nicely on the, on the back of that. So our focus right now is really making a success. We're targeting a thousand um, home solar installations over the next 12 months, starting in August, which will generate about $12 million worth of GMB for our business. Um, we are starting to operate in, um, in the US, as we mentioned. Uh, we are running a pilot in Ohio with our first credit union, which is the equivalent of a local a non-profit retail bank, but it's called a credit union. Um, and we really want to take that pilot to refine our service model for the US. And we often speak about internally, we almost want to do what we did in Vestec last year under a six month pilot. We're going to be now doing in the US over the next six months. And the outcome of that pilot will really determine what our kind of growth plan is growing into the US market going into 2023. But in the interim, the team, 
99% of all of our resources are really focused on making this NetBank campaign a success. Uh, the train has left the station and we've hitched a ride and there's no turning back now. So we got to make it work. I love the sound of that. Tim, thank you very much for joining us this evening. All of the best in your endeavor. Um, certainly a space that I'm pretty keen on myself um, and lots of upside if you get to play this right. So hopefully that train goes like a bullet. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank and, you. Uh, I'm going to bring back our Tim and Blake, perhaps just to quickly talk about the house view as regards home energy. Tim, there I see you. You're back on screen. Um, we'll bring back Blake in a sec. Can I ask you just a simple capital view? Why do we like home energy? Yeah, so I think there's, uh, there's many reasons why we like home. We've summarized a couple of them on the screen. So I'll just, I'll just go through them. Firstly, a super experienced team. They, they've been in the solar business. They understand it, having been at Eldo. Um, they know what they're doing. And, and that experience we know in startups is, is priceless. Like uh, when you're building a new business to have uh, operated in that industry before, understand the industry, it's, it's really important. And Tim and his team really have that. The market is exploding. It's growing at 42% per annum. And you've got this total addressable market of $1.7 trillion per year. So you don't have to be the main player in this market to win. You have to be one of the key players. And I think that from what you've heard tonight, like home energy really, really can do that. You know, they, they, they experience, they're building towards it. They've got a clear distribution strategy, which sort of leads me to my next point in that they, they recently signed this landmark partnership with, with NetBank. And not only does that provide the financing for these uh, solar systems, but it also uh, provides distribution. So while other people are trying to do, uh, you know, Google AdWords and knocking door to door and uh, trying different distribution techniques, they are actually going uh, through this, uh, you know, B2, B2, B2C to uh, approach, which is really interesting. And it's a completely different spin on, on distribution in this industry. And I think it's, it's really interesting. It's cost effective and, and it yields great results as we're seeing. Uh, and then, and, and, and that sort of leads to point four, which is super strong traction in this business. $900,000 in GMV since inception, a qualified pipeline of $2 million, growing at $1.2 million per month. Um, they've already rolled out a national footprint across South Africa. As Tim mentioned, they've launched in Ohio, they're going into California. Um, they've managed to actually do the corporate sales work, which delivers these live banking partners. We, we know that corporate sales is really tough. So having got that action is, is, is impressive. Uh, and they're currently conducting over 150 site visits per month. So this is a business that is really going places. We're excited to be part of it. And um, yeah, we're bullish on this, on both the space and the business. As you said, lots of reasons to like home energy. Um, South African qualified skill sets arbitraging their way into the US. Blake, which always makes me think of you, um, perhaps just a quick overview of deal terms and how one, um, what, what the instrument re really that one would be investing into. And for our viewers, top left is that QR code. I've actually just made my own pledge. So I know that it does work. Blake, the deal instrument, please. So uh, if the community members out there think this is a home run, then um, this is the deal at hand. Um, so Spark Energy Services Inc. is the legal entity which is domiciled in the US. This is a safe note instrument that will convert at either a 20% discount on the Series A valuation um, or at a $25 million pre-money cap, whichever is lower. Um, this is a seed round, $3 million in total. Tim Olson has carved out 300K for simple capital community members, and you can invest from as low as $1,000. Willem, over to you. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, then let's move along swiftly and talk about Tulix. I will be joined in studio by Brian and by Alistair. Um, and we're going to bring them up in a second. Uh, perhaps just while we wait for technology to catch up. Um, of course, Tulix, a remittance solution. There we go. There's Brian. Brian, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Simple Capital Fraternity and Platform. 
uh, as one of our Genesis platform community round members. Where in the world are you tonight? I'm actually dialing in from Nairobi, Kenya tonight. Well, welcome from Nairobi, Kenya. Yes. Brian, um, we're going to give you the floor. I'm going to disappear into the background while you go through your presser, and then I'll collate the questions in the background. Uh, all of the best for your pitch, and over to you. Thank you, Willem. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you once again to Simple Capital for this uh, amazing showcase. I do actually apologize on behalf of Alistair. He's currently right now in London at a Catalyst Fund event where we are showcasing Tulix uh, to, to a, a larger group of investors on that front. So I will just be me today. So please feel free to shoot your uh, comments uh, or questions in the chat. So I'll just break it down and literally just start from a very interesting background whereby Tulix is uh, a new take on the remittance industry in Africa specifically. And it's because of the effect we've seen remittances have on households in our continent. And to highlight how impactful this is, one in seven people around the world send or receive remittances. And in Africa, that counts to about 200 million people alone who receive this money. And it's not money that's intended for any other thing other than upkeep or actually basic needs and recurrent needs. So it's money that should be treated with care or should be treated with caution and should be actually identified and earmarked for specific purposes. So when we started looking at Tulix, it was because of our own individual experiences, whereas individuals here in Kenya and even just working from other different parts of the world, we've been in situations where we needed that last mile accountability or that last mile visibility in order to facilitate remittances that are more impactful. So I'll highlight one use case whereby uh, I do have friends and family who live abroad and they do come to me a lot for that last mile visibility. And the reason is because when you look at the remittance market in Africa specifically, there are 36 million African migrants who actually live abroad and are documented from all the different African countries. And on paper, they're doing roughly about $85 billion in inflows to the, to the continent. But the key challenge that's not been addressed is that that money easily comes into Africa, but at the last mile, that connectivity is very complex. And this is essentially because of the way Africa is as a continent. It's essentially fragmented into specific units that operate on different platforms. So, for example, I'm in Kenya right now where mobile money is predominantly the main way of transacting. And if I go, say, to Nigeria or South Africa, that's not the case. So that uniformity literally lends itself to creating that complexity at the last mile. So we've been running a close private beta for around eight months and the key uh, point of this was to understand what are the needs and challenges of the African diaspora community and how are their beneficiaries also responding to the money they're receiving and what we learned was quite uh, shocking whereby 82 percent of the people sending money and this is a representative example of about 1500 respondents actually want to make payments themselves. They're tired of sending money into Africa and then require someone to walk to an agent to collect that money or send it to someone's mobile wallet and then lose that visibility. And then the other hand is that 74% of these same respondents claim they're not able to increase how much they're sending simply because of this last mile uh, uh, lack of accountability or visibility. There's no connection between you sitting somewhere in New York or in Durban or even in London and sending money back home to Nairobi you actually give up when you use, say, for example, uh, WISE or Wild Remit or even TransferWise. That transaction ends as soon as you made the payment. And once the money arrives in Kenya, that's a whole different transaction. So what we are actually trying to solve is this last mile effort, whereby as a business structured here, headquartered here and with Kenyan founders who know this market really well, we are building in that last mile connectivity. And how are we doing this? We've looked at the market in remittances and we realized another fundamental opportunity is that the senders and their recipients have never been connected. So if I use, say, example, while remit and uh, someone back home is using M-Pesa, those are two different platforms. But here we've built a single mobile app that lets users from wherever in the world to share money, pay their own bills directly and manage the money they are allocating back home to their beneficiaries. And it doesn't matter where you are, you're able to do this with just a single app. What's amazing is that 
instead of always having to send money, now you can actually create shared wallets for your beneficiaries and allocate that money for them to spend, whereby you can even earmark those funds for very specific use cases. Think of uh, specific needs such as healthcare bills, uh, education bills, uh, even just rent on a daily, on a monthly basis. You can actually earmark those, those, uh, those funds and have that last mile visibility and accountability. And the best part about beneficiaries they can as well request you for the money. So that's even another good experience. So we've actually looked at what is this gap that remittances that are built out of Africa are in solving. And we realized it's a unified experience. It's being able to create a single platform whereby you as a remitter and you as your beneficiaries can interact and collaborate on finances. You can actually engage together and be able to transact together. So that's the, the, the platform we've built and it's called the Tulix app where for every, uh, diaspora uh, migrant who downloads the app or uses the app, they just create a wallet, load it with different payment options. They can use their card, uh, their bank account soon. And for the guys who are local and need to also do some of this transaction they leave, they can also use mobile money. Now, the other thing we've innovated in, which is the sharing aspect, is a feature we know we call JAWS. So JAWS are this unique uh, solution that we implemented on the on the Tulix app during the beta program, whereby I can create my jar and add my beneficiaries to it and specify where these funds can go or cannot go. And that is a really, really unique feature because it's something we have learned from the respondents in our beta and also people we've been surveying of how much they want this functionality. Then the best part is that we're riding it all on mobile money. So mobile money, as I've mentioned, is the one of the most dominant payment methods here in uh, East Africa, for example, and it's growing quite rapidly in Africa as a, as a continent, whereby payments are originating and only happening on mobile money as a platform and this is going to be changing especially in other markets as they continue to adopt other new payment methods we've seen the likes of guys like mastercard getting an interest in this last mile solution so that's an interesting space for us to observe so on our app this is exactly what you're able to do now talking about who our customers are we haven't gone for the general, everyone who sends money is my customer. In fact, from our data, we realized that we're targeting a very specific demographic. They're primarily female and age around 27 to 45 years old. Some of them are self-employed, but the rest are also employed, but they also end up to being very tech savvy. And the ones we've been speaking to and who are most actively engaged live in the US, UK, or in the UAE and are very active diaspora community members. And some of the ways we are reaching them is through these communities that they belong to, through social media, and through other content marketing and influencer strategies. Now, I will have you know that this is not the only segment we are currently supporting. Uh, Tulix is actually something you can download from anywhere you are in the world. So even in Africa, Africa, we are seeing a growing need and a growing demand for make, maybe Kenyans who live in Uganda, Kenyans who live in Tanzania. So these are some of the other customer segments we are looking at. Our goal is to create this unified experience for Kenyans everywhere and then build this out for other markets. Now, looking at the addressable market, it's $85 billion. However, the African Union recently did a study and it was about $200 billion wide. And this is because half of the remittances in Africa are informal. People would rather carry money in their suitcases when they're traveling back home to make those large payments that they wouldn't be able to make through traditional remittances. People are more comfortable uh, using, say, for example, Hawala. It's very popular in the Somali community. And there are other channels that are just not allowing for more impactful ways to tap into this really, really big uh, opportunity coming into Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's about a $42 billion market. And in Kenya alone, it's a $3.9 billion market, which is where we are starting from. Uh, the, the, the competition is quite uh, interesting. And this is a question we get quite a lot, whereby a simple question is, how are we differentiated? How is Tulix different? What are we doing that's different from all the players we've seen? So we are building Tulix to empower Africa's diaspora. And as I have mentioned, the remittance receiving households are looking for ways to allocate funds and earmark them for very specific needs. Now, this is a segment known as the four purpose remittance space, whereby our ability to innovate has allowed us to leapfrog using technology and using our available mobile money channels to build that solution in our market first and then translate those learnings in other markets where it's not possible. We're seeing this uh, growing need, especially in South, uh, Southeast Asia, where that has been catalyzed 
analyzed specifically by the pandemic and other other uh, effects on the world where remittances are becoming a necessity in more than a luxury. And these are things that we are noticing in our continent as well. And we've decided to pioneer the first remittance solution for purpose remittance solution for Africa. And some of the key differentiators where we differ from a lot of these other remittance players is whereby we are allowing users to coexist with their beneficiaries through the jars and shared wallets. We give you the ability to track the money you're spending, track the money you're sending. And also we have an instant and direct integration mobile money network that makes it easy for you to sit in New York and pay a business here in Kenya in real time. The last bit that I have also mentioned about is the ring fence payments, whereby we are able to look at payments and make sure they can be earmarked for very specific use cases. So those are some of the ways we're very differentiated from the traditional remittances. Now, looking at how we generate generate revenue, it's pr primarily through transaction fees. However, we are also looking at how we build in our internal compliance controls and other licensing measures so that we can add additional revenue expansion opportunities. The typical remitter with us right now is spending on average $250, but some could even go as high as $5,000 a month. And to acquire these users through the channels that indicated earlier, it's about nine bucks. So looking at the typical remittance user, we estimate that they will spend with us roughly three years before they choose, uh, before we are able to choose a different way of monetizing this or before we are able to even increase the value options we are, we are able to offer at the moment. Now, from our closed beta in the last eight months, we've been very, very strict in who we are letting in. Uh, we've managed to acquire over 1,500 people currently in our wait list. We are moving out of beta at the end of this month. We've already verified 25,000 merchants in Kenya alone. We processed slightly above $40,000 in the last few few weeks. And then the, 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 the beauty of this is that we've learned so much from the over 1,000 transactions we've managed individually to see how these funds are being earmarked, to see how these funds are arriving at the merchants. And learning from that data is allowing us now to pioneer the growth phase that will see us acquire 10,000 active users towards the end of the year. Now, looking at our journey, our journey started from uh, Antler, who is a global uh, VC, currently in 18 or 19 markets globally. And we've grown with them all the way until we recently just graduated out of the Catalyst Fund program. Now, Catalyst Fund is a very selective, uh, inclusive fintech program. And we were one of six startups selected globally to, to, be, to receive venture building and to receive mentorship from the likes of PayPal, JP Morgan, and other major organizations. So as I mentioned, Alistair currently right now is attending an event on that behalf whereby we'll be showcasing the learnings and what we're going to do next. Then at the, towards the end of the year, we're also working with other local businesses where we act as a distribution platform for their services towards the diaspora market. Our goal is not to just be a remittance player. We want to open up the African economy to those diaspora markets, which are very hard to penetrate through traditional means without technology. Then the next thing we're doing, we're also looking at partnerships that go beyond mobile money. A key partnership we've managed to secure is uh, with Ukesha, a South Africa-based MasterCard API partner, where we'll be piloting card payments and other virtual card payment options in Kenya and then officially roll them out to other markets. So plenty of ex exciting uh, growth partnerships going on and plenty of exciting programs we'll be releasing over the next few months. The team is myself and Alistair, as well as a team of other senior professionals we've managed to onboard in the last few months. Uh... Sorry, something happened to my slide, but yes, I was talking about the team. Alistair is a financial professional. He's been in investment banking for the last 15 years. I myself, I'm a professional uh, in marketing and in startups. I've worked with startups for the last 10 years across different fields in product, marketing, ops, and the like. And together we've just come with that complete and harmonized skill set that allows us to understand the market we're in. We've been remittance beneficiaries ourselves, and we understand what the needs of this market are better than say a business formed in New New York for an African recipient here in Kenya. Our goal, and especially now that we fully understand the vision and the mission of our business, is that five years from now, we will have reduced the complexity and created the transparency that remittances are lacking, especially at the last mile, for over 5 million Africans globally. Doing this is very important, especially as we look at the income gaps and those that are actually growing, especially due to factors like climate change, the war in Ukraine, and other pandemics. It's very important for us to tackle this space in a way that is very impactful for the senders, the beneficiaries 
beneficiaries and the ecosystem at large, which includes the communities that these people belong to. So I thank you very much for just giving me this opportunity. Here's a quick wrap of, uh, recap of what we are actually working on. We're in a huge market. The team is very experienced. We successfully rolled out the second iteration of the product and we're pioneering smarter remittances for the African diaspora and the African local beneficiaries who can really benefit from this. So thank you very much. I welcome your questions. Brian, I see a lot of pictures. Um, excellent. And I will just say that as the questions have been coming through, I was like ready to give them to you, but you answer them in the next section. So there were questions of telling us about your team, uh, when you come out of beta, um, what about the regulatory approvals and what makes you different? You've, you've hit all of them, but there is one that remains, which is how will neobanks respond to this? And is remittance not a function of a neobank that we can expect? And will this not impact you negatively? So maybe just a quick comment um, from your side on this sort of overall trend globally. Yes. No, I, I love that question. That's actually an amazing question. Uh, so the neobank space is one that's becoming uh, very vertically uh, di differentiated, whereby we are seeing a neobank can't just exist as a neobank. It's getting competition from a neobank intended for one demographic versus another. So what we've been understanding, and especially with the work we've been doing with the Catalyst Fund team, is looking at how does FinTech in Africa evolve and what are the catalysts that lead to a neobank surviving here in this continent. And I did allude to that fragmentation in Africa that does limit how far one neobank can penetrate across different markets and how well it serves a particular need. So the market we've gone against or we've gone after is the for purpose remittance market, whereby yeah. we're not trying to do everything in finance or everything in embedded finance. Rather, we are building a last mile connectivity solution that enables the person who is living in the diaspora to make that last mile payment to a business here in Kenya. And then on top of that, we're bringing their beneficiaries closer to them so that they can interact together. The typical neobank may go after uh, a demographic that's maybe student-based or maybe uh, uh, fi finance or industry-based. We've gone after the typical person who is sending the money and the person who is receiving the money and combine them into one. So we are not a traditional neobank, I would say. We are more like a remittance business, but more that that's one that's 2.0 remittances here in Africa. So we will know that they'll come with their different responses, but we've already identified ways that we can even work with them as opposed to challenging them in their own space. Superb. Brian, you've really um, hit the nail on the head tonight. I think you've hit the bull's eye. And I think that our investors will concur. Uh, you certainly seem super in control of your destiny here. And I've been noticing that you're also smiling all the while you're talking. So it looks like you're having fun, which is always a great thing to see in an entrepreneur. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we wish you all the very best in your endeavor. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight. And welcome to the Simple Capital Fraternity, Brian. It's um, been a pleasure. I'm going to bring back Tim and Blake, and I'm going to let Brian go. Um, Tim has just sidestepped, ironically, after our home energy expose about of load shedding. So, Tim, glad that you could make it back. Um, uh, and without further ado, the house view on why we like Tulix, after which we're going to deal terms with Black. Yeah, thanks, Willem. Uh, I, I think I'll be signing up not only to invest in home, but also as a customer. Um, so yeah, at Tulix is is a really interesting business that we we're really excited about, and I think uh, someone said to me the other day that you know businesses that solve unique challenges, especially in Africa, are probably going to be the ones that are, are are most successful. And I think Tulix is really solving this unique challenge where you've got this uh, diaspora community that's gone out, uh, you know, is global but is sending money back home. And so you, you've got a team that is dealing with a massively transformative purpose, which is key to our investment mandate as simple capital and is reflected in their everyday mission. And I think uh, to your point, the team there are really excited about what they're doing and, and um, that, that gets us excited, of course. Second, it's a huge market opportunity. You've got 36 million plus um, Africans living abroad, sending over nearly $100 billion a year back to, back to Africa. Uh, and if Tulix crack this, it'll, they've got $125 million revenue opportunity just in the next five years. If they get just their 
sort of calculations right. So huge opportunity there. They have got great initial traction, having uh, launched their closed beta in Q3 of last year. They've already got 25,000 verified merchants. They processed over $40,000 in six months, and they're on track to acquire 10,000 active users in 2022. They've also been selected for a number of programs, including uh, our partners at Catalyst Fund, uh, their inclusive fintech cohort. Uh, and so we're, we're really excited about this business. We, we think that there's, there's really a, a, a real problem that they are solving, this idea that you can allocate where your money is so that you have some control as, as, as someone who's gone to another country to earn this money to make sure that funds are spent on school fees and not on other things. That's a real problem in Africa and, and they're solving it. So uh, as, as folks who, who obviously live in Africa, we, we understand this and, and uh, we're really excited about this business. I think it's going to do really well. Tim, then of course the power of community uh, rounds also that the actual customers of the company get the opportunity to participate in funding the business. So almost like engineering the success of the business that you use for the problem that it solves for you, which is uh, just a wonderful synergy. Um, exactly. Blake, to make that synergy work, top left, scan if you like, takes you to the form. What's the deal structure? So we'll be investing into Tulix Inc., which is a U.S. domiciled entity, so an African business with its IP and its hold co in the investor-friendly USA. Safe note, $4 million post-money valuation cap, earlier stage business pre-seed in, in this funding round. Um, Brian's allocated and carved out 200 k for simple capital, and again, from as low as $1,000. Thanks, Philip. All right, superb. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question that came through late um, for Tulix, which is what do the next 12 months look like? Gentlemen, I don't know if you guys want to just quickly feel that before we switch to Bert, or do we pose this at the very end? Um, we can also, of course, put that into our newly established WhatsApp feed from Simple Capital. Um, your tech. But I'd say in the interest of time, uh, let's let's deal with that offline. Thanks. All right. Perfect. Then, gentlemen, thank you very much. That was the Tulix deal overview and why Simple Capital likes it house view. Um, next up, uh, let's bring Bert uh, into studio. Here we go. This is from Builder. And I personally am um, delighted that we're going to welcome Bert back to our audience tonight. Um, all the way from, I believe, Montreal, Bert, is that right? That's correct, all the way from Montreal. So there we go. Well, welcome back. You're no stranger to the Simple Capital community. For the new community members, Bert was one of our very first investments um, with an entity named Builder. And Bert, you've just gone from strength to strength since our first engagement. Congratulations, first of all, and well done. And we're super excited to hear what you have in store for us tonight. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited, um, super grateful as well. Uh, you've been among the first believers uh, into this um, right when it was like two years ago, uh, first summer. Uh, we just started, I think we had like two or three customers at the time only. And uh, yeah, it's been such a journey since then. So uh, quite excited to present all the results that we, we've been having over the last uh, uh, two years, yeah, to the audience. Well, we're super keen to hear from it, Burton. I will just share with you, I've just gone through the process of a uh, home renovation and the amount of pain that it's caused me has turned me from a keen investor into an evangelist. If you were in this time zone, I would most certainly be using your services. I hope that you come here soon to help some of my compatriots avoid the pain of home renovation in what I now am fundamentally convinced is an unbelievably big market with a huge value proposition. That's so, awesome. good. let's hand over to you and hear about the magic of Builder. Awesome. Um, just, damn it, like the, it seems that the, that the maximum size is 50. Um, Jason, I think you have it. I don't know if it's possible on your side to share it because it says to me that 
there is a maximum capacity of 50 MBs and my file is 56. Sucks a bit. Because uh, I cannot share my screen. Oh, maybe I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, let me know once you've clicked there. I've got some action on my screen, and now we've got the building the yes. platform trusted partner. You're live. The magic. Oh, right. That's awesome. All right, so we'll we'll do it right away. We'll read like this. Um, so for everyone who's the first time that they're hearing about a company, so what are we? We are a managed home innovation marketplace. Uh, so we treat the platform to help power your uh, renovations for homeowners and general contractor. So to give you a sense. Uh, the average project size on the platform is $100,000. So for those who were with us uh, two years ago, we started the average project size was 40000 Last year, it increased to 70000 This year, it's 100000 So homeowners have been trusting us with bigger and bigger home innovations. We've helped 800 uh, 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 customers so far like paying and started to use a service uh, all the way from the design phase. And currently... We have about 50 active general contractors across three cities, Montreal, Toronto, and um, Chicago. So let's talk about uh, the homeowner experience, and then we'll talk about the general contract experience. So the homeowner experience, so the value prop for them, we are a one-stop shop platform for homeowners from design. Um, so where we uh, help them scope the project in detail with a project manager, give them an independent assessment of the cost, all that from uh, a central dashboard that we call the central information hub for them to the second phase getting bids from contractors very contractors on the platform where homeowners can finally get quotes that are easily comparable between them and they can hire the contractor right away from the dashboard and um, the last phase which is constructions so they get access to a dashboard where they can track everything that's happening um, all the change order requests the invoices tracking their budget uh, all along um, the work and we're building more and more services on that platform. On the general contractor side, which is important on the marketplace, what's the value prop? We are building the technology infrastructure to help them grow and operate their business. So it started with one, providing them with a platform where they can get access to qualified leads, meaning that they can open an app and, and, and now we just released like um, uh, a desktop version where they can simply see projects available around them with a scope of work he paid it, uh, detailed, already made. Every customer has paid a deposit, so it's all construction-ready projects. Um, and it's a much better experience for them because right now the statu quo across the globe is getting random calls from random people asking you, hey, can you come to my place to renovate my home or to rent my basement or whatever it is? But that means nothing for a contractor. They still have to go vet the project, make sure the customer is actually serious and et cetera. Um, they can lose for a project of over $100,000, they can lose like 20 to 30 hours working for free. So we have a very shitty experience for most GCs. Uh, and with us, like, they love it. It's construction ready projects. Customers are not wasting their time. It's right away. Um, some of us are, are telling us, oh, it's like ordering on Uber Eats. You can just go open your app, click on, I'm interested in this project and sending a quote. Uh, we've doubled the conversion rate. Uh, just by doing all that. So we have a, an amazing, and that's what I'm the most pumped about. I think we have the best retention and engagement metrics out of all competitors out there. And we go further, not just providing qualified leads, we also automate their back office. So we started by automating like the quotation aspect for them to really send quotes uh, fast, invoicing um, all the transactions flowing to the platform, disbursing to their bank account, we're building more and more. Um, and now, you know, they can have like track all their invoices. Now, uh, in two weeks, we're releasing a SaaS to fully automate the back office, meaning fully organizing the work that exists between a general contractor, the subcontractor, the employees, the suppliers. And we're going to build financial services on top of it. So really the vision for us is to build what we call a market network. So that has been my thesis uh, since 2018 when I thought about the business. Uh, so it took me a year and a half to from that thesis, trying to understand the market, what we need before we launch in 2020. So the market network is work. It's three pieces into one. Um, it's a marketplace, one, to control the experience between homeowners and general contractors. And then two, it's a SaaS to completely automate the back of these general contractors and all of their workflows, their project management uh, uh, um, uh, uh, responsibilities, as well as like anything related to uh, their finance, profitability, cash flow, visibility, and et cetera. 
And then the third layer is financial services. So we're talking about warranty and financing for home renovation on the homeowner side. By the way, uh, for those on the call who've done renovation, you know your home renovations are not insured. So if something goes wrong after, it's nuts, but it's you just have to chase your contractor. And um, so this quarter, we're releasing like a pilot program, a warranty program after the work has been completed. And it's great because we have the data on an in incidence rate and then we can build more financial services on top of it. And then the other aspect of the financial services that we have in mind to build for general contractors is anything related to a spend management platform, corporate credit card. We already have all access to the transaction flow uh, based on the activity on the platform and the marketplace. Now it's just easier just to plug that in and, and really be that uh, technology infrastructure to, for, for GCs. So quite pumped in terms of the result. Uh, we've been growing 70% quarter over quarter over the last six quarters, just to get a sense. We met Simple Capital here in Q2 2020. We were tiny. Uh, and uh, yeah, this past quarter now we've just uh, done over like 2 million uh, in GMV and uh, we have like a huge pipeline for the summer. So again, uh, we're going to do like about like over 3 million uh, in Q3 and then in Q5. So the good, the, the good thing with us is that uh, because that cycle is long, you can kind of foresee based on the volume of contract that you sign uh, what's going to happen uh, three, six months from now. So, yeah, so that's about it. Superb. Um, I just got a comment here which made me smile because I deeply resonated it from uh, Ludolf. He says, when are you coming to Africa? We need builder with a couple of exclamation marks. Ludolf, I'm with you, man. Uh, definitely. But perhaps on a more serious note, uh, Bert, just proceeds for this round, what is the intended use? So um, right now for everyone on the line, we just crossed, so we crossed like over 110 monthly revenue. I want to get us to 160 so we can say like, all right, like we crossed that 2 million um, annualized mark. We're doing about 800,000 per month in, in GMV. Want to get that to 1.4 uh, million by, by default. So right now we're raising 2 million. Uh, valuation proceeds. I already have 1.7 million in our commitments. Already closed on Friday and wired to the bank account 1.2. So we're just literally like missing 300k to close that. Uh, it's not going to be in a high valuation. We're doing it at the 15 million uh, pre-money uh, cap. So pretty much a joke. We yeah, a joke. I just want to close it very fast. Um, and yeah, so the proceed for us is literally. Uh, two folds. I want to raise my Series A by the end of the year. So for that to happen, two things need to happen. Montreal is already at a 67% gross margin. Ridiculous. Nobody betted on us to, to have those margins, not for a managed home innovation marketplace. And I want to get Toronto and Chicago, the, the new expansion markets, who Toronto has one, is one year old. Chicago is not even one year old yet. I want to get them closer to 30% gross margin, 40% gross margin, and, and show to investors before we raise the Series A that, hey, those two markets, too, are turning to our direction. And yeah, we can uh, literally build like a profitable business out of it, a very profitable business, by the way, out of it, uh, when you look at our unit economics. So these are the two things. Um, the two million is to literally protect me from the downside on the worst and worst case scenario, like the, more, the the world goes into complete shit for the next two years. And for whatever reason, we can raise our Series A by the end of the year. But I, you know, that's how I run the business. Uh, we work too hard um, to get where we are. So I want to make sure that when I go back and talk to my team, I tell them, hey, whatever is happening, worst case scenario is covered. We raised that little two million, whatever. Um, so don't worry about it. Continue to build and uh, it'd be on me in the fall to raise that Series A so that uh, we can expand and, of course, like uh, uh, come to other continents. Uh, although right now, I think this year and next year, we're going to stay focused in North America. Does that make sense? such an important thing to be able to keep the team focused and not worried about survival. We see that yeah. so often. So I'm glad that that's uh, dedicated in your strategy. Um, to a macro question, perhaps, Bert. Mm -hmm. Post-pandemic, do you still see a lot of home renovation because people are going back to the office or just broadly, what are your observations around this aspect of the market? So two things that's really exciting for, for everyone to understand. So we're talking about a market just in North America, like just Canada and um, the US. It's $450 billion. That was in 2019, that number. So in 2022, it's likely over $500 billion. 
market is growing 9% uh, com- um, annually over the last uh, seven to eight years. So huge market, we tiny. This year, we're planning to do about 15 to 20 million in GMV. It's tiny. It's, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, so despite the big macro environment, we don't expect it to impact us. If we were doing a couple of billion dollars every year, I would say, yes, I'm worried. But right now, I'm not seeing anything being stopped, not on the homeowner side. The things that I'm seeing, though, right now, that's also exciting, it's we are seeing a cost of acquisition decrease. So over the last two months, decreased massively. So my sense is that we're getting less companies out there that are bidding um, on on ads. So it's actually like much cheaper. Just to give you a sense, uh, right now in Montreal, it costs us a hundred dollar uh, to get a lead for a hundred thousand dollar home innovation project. We're not talking about peanuts or um, or bread here. We're talking about big rentals, and it's so cheap to acquire homeowners. So that's something exciting. Like the other aspect that we're seeing as well is it's getting easier and easier to onboard contractors. I guess it's a multiplication of um, a better product and, and and a better platform and a better name. But also, I think generally that if once things start to slow down for most GCs, they'll be more and more on the lookout for uh, a platform like us. Um, to get an eye on for, for, for the business and, and the activity. But, and that talks to a, a question that holds hands with what you've just articulated. And the question reads as follows, how scalable is the continued growth, especially considering contracting markets, mm-hmm. uh, possible recessions and increasing cost of finance? Okay. So as, as you've yeah. articulated, I think we need to differentiate between the growth of the industry and the growth of builder. Exactly, exactly. So, so to answer the questions, because there, there are multiple questions to one, how do we think about the sustainable growth of the business? Um, I think I've answered in two folds. The first thing that I needed to show to investors was, yes, if you build a managed marketplace, you can show gross margin over 60%. Just think about it. We've done that with a team that's about two years old, um, pretty much subpar tech, Tech is just catching up on operations, a bunch of things that should be automated. Um, there is capacity for us to increase um, the bandwidth for operation managers and operation teams to be able to take on more projects without increasing the size of the team, just pure, purely building more automations. So pretty exciting to me that, you know, if 60% is our base today for like uh, a more mature markets, I think I can show like 70, 75%. So that's one. So I'm like, sorry. So on the operational, it works. The second, qu- the second question is related to sustainable growth. Is like, what's happening during a downturn? I think mm-hmm. if for for those who are uh, entrepreneurs and 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 founders, what you see during downturn 2008 and etc. is that your cost per acquisition decrease because just less people are just using like you know the ads, for example. It's already low um, in in our markets versus like the size of the projects. So I'm actually getting excited and, and our numbers are showing are, are trending down. So that I'm not too worried. And then the last piece is what's happening on the macro side. So um, in 2000, let's talk about the crisis of 2008 and 2009, which was also like related to also a financial cri- uh, a recent crisis as well. So at that time, the market reached a peak in 2007. We were close to 300 billion in um, annual home innovation being spent. We went to a throw in 2009 after the financial crisis around 220. You can look up the numbers on US Census. So the market lost about a third, right? So I told myself, like, you know, you know, even in the despair and when whole hell broke loose, it was still 200 billion of home innovation being spent across North America. As I said, we tiny. So let's say now the market is 500 billion. The market, like there is a recession coming over the next two years. We go back 30, 40%. You're still going to get a market that's 250, 300 billion annually. Again, we're doing 15 to 20 million. Uh, there's nothing stopping us, but just taking more and more shares into that market. I think what you're seeing is more trend that's happening on um, the, the, the nature of the, the society where like millennials are representing a higher share of home ownership. Uh, in North America. And that's the trend. That's betting on my generation. My generation just want to go on a website. They're lazy. They just want to go on a website, like click, having someone come home and do the work. Um, so that's the trend that we're seeing. And I think it's just going to accelerate. So I think a larger and larger share of home innovations will actually be done on online platforms versus offline. Right now, the main competitor is offline. 
all of the platforms combined to give you a sense are doing less than 0.5% of the entire uh, GMV in North America. So 99.5 or 99.6% of renovations are happening offline. That's our competition. And offline, the expense is shit uh, because you just have to run and doing everything by yourself and nothing is structured, nothing is reliable and all that. So, um, yeah, so that's really what's happening for us. Well, we've come to know you as someone who says it as it is, and I'm glad to see that that is still continuing. Perhaps a final question from our audience that talks about seasonality, Montreal and Canada, oh, sorry, Montreal and Chicago get cold. Yeah. Can, you build, can you build when it snows? And how do you plan on dealing with seasonality really is the question. Yeah, so it, it's, it's pretty funny. We started with like markets with high seasonality, so northern markets. You can even include Toronto into that. But Toronto, to a certain extent, it's, it's actually a little bit warmer than uh, Chicago and, and Montreal are. So what's happening on the seasonality side is what you're seeing is that you're going to see Q1 and Q2 being slower markets. So Q1, usually like there's a lot of renovation that cannot be done that touch on the external uh, um, side of, of a property uh, just simply because the weather is too cold. Uh, so you can only do inside. So we usually use Q1 to onboard massively general contractors for the year. That's perfect quarter. It's a downtime for general contractors, perfect time for them for us to onboard them. And then we use Q1, Q2 to sign a lot of homeowners for the year. We really tell them, hey, homeowners, like, you need to take yourself like six months in advance. So you need to sign your contract very early on in the year if you want renovation to happen the same year. Uh, so that's basically how we, uh, we've been learning. Now, we in three markets. Next year, we want to launch three to four other markets. They're all going to be southern cities. So literally, sun cities. Uh, we're thinking about Miami. We're thinking about Atlanta. We're thinking about Austin in Texas. Uh, thinking about Phoenix. So these are the markets we want because I think I'm going to run a lot as well on what the seasonality is happening within sun cities. I think we're not going to get the same thing. I think it's going to be pretty much uh, 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 about the same uh, throughout the year. So uh, I think we're going to learn new dynamics happening in those markets as well. So I think it's time next year. It's going to be time for us to learn a bit more about sun cities. But yes, with northern markets, we have to deal with sun cities. Brilliant. Uh, ladies and gents, as you can see, a man who is also in control of his destiny and has got his hand firmly on the rudder of the ship. But always a pleasure to talk with you. Always a privilege. Love looking at your business, just shooting the lights out and all of the best with this round and your future endeavor. Um, we hope to see you again soon. And I'm going to let you go when I bring Tim and Blake back on for the house view uh, and also some deal terms. Thank you, Bert. Thanks so much. Thank you. Gentlemen, yeah, so much can be said for, for that man. Uh, unbelievable talent. Tim, what's the house view on why we not like but love Builder? Yeah, I think everybody knows that we, uh, that we love Builder. Uh, but I think the, the key thing, like when I saw that revenue graph that uh, Bert put up, I thought that's, that's the reason we love Builder, <laughs> is exactly what's happening there. So amazing traction uh both across gmv and revenue um you know in 2021 so last year they grew revenue eight times year on year they're looking at doing that again in 2022 often these numbers slow down they don't speed up um and you're looking at 400 plus percent year on year revenue growth uh it's it's incredible what the guys are doing and they're only just getting started this is only the beginning of the mission they've only launched into one city in the US. Uh, <laughs> imagine when, you know, we see three, four, five cities in the US start to come on board, which talks to like the geographic expansion. They're looking at going into seven markets by the end of 2023 um, and hitting this GMV number of $100 million. So uh, definitely the time to get involved in this investment if you're not already in. Um, the home renovation market has been as discussed, enormous. Uh, it's enormous across the US and, and Canada, as much as I think there are lots of folks here in South Africa who would love to see these guys, uh, you know, come here or, or come to other markets. They have a ton to do in the US and Canada before they even need to consider global expansion, which I think is so so exciting that their, that their core market is just so huge and that they're a pinprick in that at the moment and doing so well. Um, and then I think a, a part that I can I can personally vouch for having worked with Bert and the GM of expansion for Uber in the US, Chris Rowe, 
at Uber is that this is a strong team. Like these are some of our strongest, uh, or these were some of our strongest folks at Builder, uh, sorry, at Uber. And they're now both in this uh, small builder team. So it's a real powerhouse. And um, I'm, I'm super excited about what, they, what they're able to do. So this business is one that I think we continue to back and sits at the top of, 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 um, of the ones that we really uh, like. Yeah, 100%. Uh, such strong credentials, an exciting business. And I guess because of my personal pain, in the home renovation space, I'm also super excited to the extent that I've just scanned that code top left. Uh, and if you do, it'll bring you up with the form that you can complete uh, expressing your interest to make an investment. Blake, if we do the investment, just talk us through deal terms, please. Sure. So the investment will be into Build Inc., which is, again, a USA domiciled entity. Uh, this is a pre-Series A round, $2 million, $1.7 million, as, as Bert has just said. I had to update the slide from $1.5 million when we last spoke. So this round is filling up fast. And also a great signal is that Quebecor and One Way Ventures have continued to back the business as well um, and following on in this round. So always a good signal to, to incoming and follow-on investors. Again, a safe note instrument. $15 million pre-money valuation cap. We've got an allocation of 200 of the remaining 300 um, uh, from as low as $1,000. Thanks. For Brilliant. It. Thank you, sir. Um, on our next slide, just the QR code again, enlarged. Uh, if you do find any of these investments that we've brought to you tonight interesting and you're convinced about their opportunity, please hover your phone or smart device over this QR code, which will bring up the form that takes you into the process of being able to invest in them. Um, perhaps just the last a overview uh, structurally to talk about where your money goes. So if you like the investment and you do want to be a part, you've scanned the QR code, filled in the form from a statutory perspective. Tim Willis, just quickly talk us through how this works uh, from a structural perspective, please. Thanks, Willem. Uh, so the folks who've invested with us before know that they are investing via a preference share in Simple Capital Limited. That is the gray, uh, the long oblong gray company in the middle. Uh, and that uh, company is specifically, it only holds investments, all of the operational costs, such as our, our salaries and other operational things that happen at Simple Capital are in Simple Capital Partners Limited. So there's a juristic separation between the two entities. Uh, each of these uh, exciting opportunities tonight has its own uh, preference share class. So the uh, type Q will be home, uh, U, Tulix, and W will be builder. So if you're a community round investor tonight, you will be acquiring one of those types of preference shares. There are other preference share classes in this, in this vehicle, but they are separate and ring fenced from each other. Uh, the vehicle sits in the United Kingdom. It's managed by Simple Capital Partners Limited, which is the management company, but is juristically separate. Uh, it's $1,000 per share to start with, as Blake mentioned earlier. There is a 5% upfront subscription fees, no annual fees, uh, which is very important. Most uh, funds charge you 2% per year. So by year three, you, you're in the green there with us. Uh, and on a performance fee, there is a performance fee uh, that is charged and that is taken after capital and subscription fees have been paid out. Uh, you've got various payment options, including bank transfers, credit card, Apple Pay, Google Pay. Uh, some of them have a slightly uh, higher fee, but uh, or a payment fee given the given the payment gateway. But all of those options exist uh, to make it as easy as possible to to invest with us. Tim, I will just share with you and our audience that I met with a, uh, a large fund this, this afternoon, in fact. Um, I, uh, I hope that they took the invitation to be on tonight's webinar, and they asked me about our fee structure. And I gave them the outline of what you just said now. But I was misunderstood. The guy said, oh, 5% per year is quite a lot. And when I said to him, no, this is once off at the inception of the investment, he almost fell off his chair. Uh, how do you guys get it right to be uh, so cost effective was the question. So there we go. The structure works and it's raising eyebrows, continuing to disrupt the alternative asset space. Tim and Blake, thanks for joining us tonight and for taking us through this expose. To the founders, if you're still online, thank you for joining us this evening. 
One last quick look at the big QR code, ladies and gents. Um, these investment rounds haven't got infinite windows. As you can see, these founders are moving and shaking. They want to get cracking on applying our funds to grow their businesses with and grow our value. There's the QR code. Takes you to a form. Easy to read. Easy to understand. Make sure you use this opportunity. And then from all of us at Simple Capital, we wish you well. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. And we remain dedicated to the cause, yours in prosperity. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks so much.